Have you ever opened the scripture and just can't get past one word or one verse? And it's just like keeps going over and over and over in your head. <laughs> That's kind of where I'm at today. Uh, we come to the last two Torah portions, double Torah portion this week again. Uh, the last two Torah portions of Vaikra or Leviticus. And um, it begins with this, uh, it says, Yudhe spoke to Moshe on Mount Sinai. And so this is where we get the uh, the the title for this parasha, uh, beginning in verse in chapter 25 of Leviticus, of Bahar or on the mountain, on the mountain. It is uh, the the word Bahar is uh, uh, a bait, a hay, and a resh. And of course, the the beauty of the the Paleo Hebrew. Uh, it's it's the tragedy that that was lost. I was teaching on this last week at uh, at Life Assembly, watching a, a program a news program the other night, me and Kathy, and it was uh, uh, it was Fan Mail Friday. So those of you that watched that know what I was we were watching, but um, they they ask a question on there. What is it about from your childhood or from generation past that uh, you really miss? And one of the hosts that was on the program said calligraphy. Now, calligraphy is something that uh, you know, anyone that's ever seen me write on a board knows there's not a possibility that I'm ever going to be able to do that. But uh, it, it is a beautiful, uh, a, a beautiful writing technique. And today, I mean, consider that cursive writing is, is almost lost. Uh, we have a, a generation that is being raised with uh, with print of cell phones, and uh, personally, for me, I, I you know you sometimes have a hard time uh, spelling. Why? Because your your phone, your computer, does it for you. Um, you don't have to. You you don't really have to spell that well. You, you know, I've forgotten how to do. Uh, you know, my checkbook. I have to go to my my calculator. Because it's just things that, you know, we've kind of gotten a little bit lazy at, maybe. But uh, in, in ways, we've lost a lot of beauty of things. And when the, the Paleo language, uh, and this is not a conspiracy or anything, but when the, uh, the Southern Kingdom went into Babylon, uh, they would have had the Paleo language that came out with a different... Uh, today, uh, you know, the, the language, the, the way of writing Hebrew has changed. I might be able to usually get through some of the the, the va very basic letters of the Aleph Bait in modern Hebrew, but when someone writes it in cursive, I'm totally lost. I have no idea what is there. Uh, the Paleo-Hebrew, the Paleo though it was not used at the time of Yeshua, would have been very well known, I believe. And so if we, all of that, to, to go back to this word Bahar, which is Beit, Hay, and Eresh. A Beit, of course, is the, the house. The Hay is, uh, the word is to behold, to breathe. And the Resh is the head. And so this Torah portion uh, begins with this concept of behold the head of the house. Behold the breath of the house. That on Mount Sinai, he brought them there so that they could behold, they could stand in awe, in reverence of his breath, his authority, his presence. And that leads me to the verse that I got stuck on today. I don't know if we're going to get very much farther than this. Tell the people of Israel, this is verse 2. Tell the people of Israel, when you enter the land I am giving you. I read those words this morning. And you know, with all the things that are going on in the world today, it's the, the shooting of the day, the, uh, the, the ramming attack of the day, the war of the day, the, the, the confusion of the day, the, the stupidity of the day. I mean, you know, the, the, the sign over here uh, that I've got, you can't fix stupid. I, I, I think that I need to put that like in bold letters. It's... Uh, it's absolutely, you're not going to fix it. I, I looked at Kathy the other night. We were watching, uh, you know, kind of keeping up on some of the news. And I said, there's no road back from here. 
And the truth is that why should we be looking for a road back? Um, you know, I, I said this in a message many years ago. Uh, why, why should we try driving by looking in the rearview mirror? We should be, you know, which, one is, which one is bigger? Your rearview mirror or your windshield? Well, maybe there's a message there that we should always be looking forward. And what is it that is in our forward? What is it in the windshield? As all of these things that are happening around us begin to be rearview mirror stuff, not focusing on the rearview mirror, but focusing on what is in the distance. You know, I've driven across country uh, so many times. I, uh, at five years old, I wasn't driving, thankfully, but uh, my mother and my grandmother took me from Florida, from Jacksonville, Florida, all the way to San Jose, California on a Greyhound bus. And coming from Florida where, yeah, it was, it was flat there, but, you know, I put a lot of, we planted a lot of trees in that area, so you couldn't see much of the horizon unless you went to the beach. And I still remember as a five-year-old child driving as we were on that bus and I don't know in that day maybe it was it was probably uh, highway 90 I don't know that uh, that I 10 was uh, was even made, was had been constructed at that point back then but I remember seeing the horizon just everywhere it was it was just you know there's no trees there's just nothing really and so you can see all the way into the distance you can see the mountains in the distance and there was like i wonder what it's going to be when we get there maybe that's where we're at today or maybe that's where we should be at today is beginning and i know this is not a, a subject that is new for me but how's our dream meter? <laughs> how's our, our longing for a home meter? What does, what does it do to you when you read the words, when you enter the land that I am giving you? Do you, do you spend time in this day, in, in these days, dreaming about that? I do. I wonder what it's going to be like. I, I wonder what the temple will really look like. I, I just released a message available through our website, zeal for my house. And, and why did he use the word house instead of the word home? Uh, very simple, a very simple explanation. You can uh, receive that CD through our website. Are we dreaming about what the, the temple will be like? What it will be like to when he turns that house into his home. And then we see in the book, last week's Torah portion of the, the feasts, the festivals, the three times that we will be asked. <laughs> Ask is a kind of a, an interesting word there. Let's, let's use the word invited. He's going to invite us to his house, which is now his home. He's going to invite us three times a year. Right now, we're in the middle of the, the counting of the Omer. As I'm counting, as, as I'm recording today, it's uh, day 31, I think it is, 31, 32, um, maybe 32. But uh, I did, lost count there for a second. Whichever one it is, uh, what is this time of the counting of the Omer about? It's about longing for day 50 which is a, a type of the Yovel, which is in Leviticus, Vaikra, chapter 25. What will the Yovel be like? I mean, I've been over to the land with Hayavel, uh, the ministry named after this specific thing of the Yovel. Uh, there's so much the, the release of, of debts, and not just the, the, uh, the financial debts, not just the, the physical things. It's going to be a, a total release of the debt. We're going to be out from underneath this time of bondage of sin. Uh, consider, what will it be like to come with, with thousands, millions, I, I don't know, 
of, of like-minded people that are there to visit his home, that are there to learn. You know, the rabbis have, uh, have taught this for years regarding the Yovel. There's, there's so much discussion over it. You know, what year is it actually? Well, we don't know. I mean, uh, I, I don't think that anybody actually does know what the calendar year is. We see that it's, uh, I can't even remember what year it is on the, the Hebrew calendar, but it's estimated that it's at least 240 years off through the, the time of, I, I think it was uh, around the Babylonian captivity or something, not remembering that it went exactly, but uh, the, on the Gregorian calendar, we're in the year about 6,023 well, as uh, the, the old song said, does anybody really know what time it is? Can anybody really tell? Well, the truth is, we don't know. And, and there, therein lies what Yeshua was talking about, of no man knows the day or the hour. It's, it's like the sighting of the moon. We don't know which day it's going to be, which night it's going to be. But as Shaul would tell us, uh, he would say, the Apostle Shaul, he would say, you know, it, it, it's going to come uh, at a time that's going to be like a thief in the night, but you are to be prepared. You're to know the season. It's not going to come upon you unaware unless you, you know, kind of, unless your, your mascot's an ostrich and you got your head in the sand. But it's, it's not designed to come as a, a thief in the night to us. We're to be aware of the times that we're, that we're in. But regarding the Yovel, it is said we won't actually be able, this is what rabbinical scholars say, that we will never actually uh, celebrate, observe the Yovel, the year of release, properly, until Messiah comes and teaches us. I've heard the discussions through the years of uh, uh, since the, uh, the the vineyards have been up on the Mount of Blessing on in Shiloh and various places, and Israel just celebrated seventy five years as as an as a you know seventy five years young three thousand years old, uh, and a group of people for the most part secular came back to the land, settled that land, began to build in the land. And as Ezekiel 37, or excuse me, yeah, Ezekiel 37 says, he, begins, he began to breathe into those dry bones. Began to breathe the Spirit. Began to breathe his breath. Ah, Bahar here. Behold the house of the head began to breathe his authority, his Torah, into them. Well, it takes time to be restored. We, we don't know if, if, if the Yovel has ever been done. And this is the, their point. We don't know. And I, I saw people regarding the, the vineyard owners, specifically in Israel, judging them for what they were doing. Well, you should have just looked at the scripture. Well, it's not that plain in the scripture. You know, it's pretty easy for me to sit uh, in my little office, you know, 7,000 miles away from the land and judge people who are in the midst of it or judge someone else in another community because they see the Yovel uh, in a different way than I do in this place of exile. It's easy for me to do, but it's not something I want to do. Because I understand that each of us are trying to walk this thing out. As we're looking in the windshield, looking toward home. So, there's a lot of, a lot of things regarding the kingdom that I, I, I think we should be longing for. And one of those is that in the, in the time of the kingdom, <laughs> there's a good one. I'm going to be out of a job, and, and I'm really looking forward to that. You know, not that I, I you know, I'm, I'm not trying to get out of what I do um, by any means. I mean, I do what I do for five teachings a week, and and uh, you know, a number of other things that I'm into right now. But 
I, there, there's going to be a day that I'm out of a job. Why? Because Messiah is going to be the one that's going to be teaching. I, I, I long for the day that, how is he going to do that? You know, how is it? it? Will it be a group of ambassadors? And maybe my job won't be over. Um, you know, will it be as it was, this, this word that was used at the time of Yeshua of Ecclesia, which was really unique to the, uh, the time of the Romans? They were, were using, and we see this with, with Britain and what happened there, they were using the same concept of a place that would go forth and colonize uh, Britain. It was said that uh, you know, the sun didn't set on the, the, uh, the kingdom of, of England, I, I guess, or Britain. Uh, well, that's changed a little bit, hasn't it? And, and that's not even to, to talk about the... Oh, I'd, if you got up last week, if you got up on Shabbat and, and watched the coronation, I mean, I, I didn't. I did. I, I, you know, I'll just leave it at that. I didn't. But, uh, you know, there's going to be a coronation. And Messiah, is he going to be bringing people together? Uh, ambassadors, if you would. And he will teach them. And then they will go forth and teach the nations? Well, I, I think we could make a pretty good argument out of that in the, in, uh, out of Scripture that we will be going forth. So maybe each of us will be like ambassadors, and you're going to be, you know, he's going to say, okay, you're the ambassador, ambassador to, uh, to New Zealand. That'd be a kind of a cool place. Uh, you're going to be the ambassador to, to Japan or Greenland or Timbuktu, uh, for those that know where that's on, out on the map. Um, and that's how the Torah will be disseminated. I, I don't see it as, you know, the Messiah is going to be using Zoom or, uh, or, or, or Facebook or Rumble or something. Why? Because he's into face-to-face -face relationships. And then through that, every nation once a year, uh, at the time of Sukkot, will send their ambas will send ambassadors of that nation back to Israel, and they will then meet him face to face and and learn and see the the love of a of a king that's not into pomp and circumstance for their own uh, their their own ego, but is a king who is ruling with humility and love. Something that the nations today uh, don't uh, don't see. I heard uh, I was what just happened to pick up one of the broadcasts of some people in England that were uh, you know were were being interviewed about the coronation, and one lady said, "Oh, we're just so thankful for what the royal family does for us." And I'm thinking, okay, I'm not in England. I don't know much about this this royalty thing there. But I, I know that enough to know this, that there's nothing they're doing for them, okay? Uh, there's, there's really nothing they're doing except taking their money and uh, using it for extravagant things. Don't ever look at King Charles and Coella de Ville and, and uh, think that that is the rulership of the Almighty. Verse 23 the land is not to be sold in perpetuity because the land belongs to me. I, I mean, I, I'm preparing now for my 33rd trip to the land. I was talking with someone the other day and they, uh, they said, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to, they, they just signed up for Connect Israel tour. And uh, they said, I'm, I'm looking forward to this once in a lifetime experience. And I said, yeah, I've had like 32 once in a lifetime experiences going to the land. I, I feel uh, there, there's no way to describe the, uh, the blessing that that is to have, have, been, have, have done that and to be preparing to go again. And the number 33 is kind of ringing in the back of my head because it's a very specific number in scripture. I won't go into that right now. But... I mean, I know that there is something special about the land. I, anybody that's been there, well, I can't, I can't say it like that because so many people go to the land 
and, and miss the land. It, it's it, it's like they're dis, they never connect, and that's why we uh, Hanok and myself got the this this term connect to Israel, because so many people. It's like the the old Henry Blackaby thing, experiencing God, and you know people went through experiencing God and didn't. Uh, people go to connect to the land of Israel and don't. Why? Because they're looking at all the wrong places. You know, it, it's difficult to connect to Israel when your bus driver is Palestinian and you're staying in Palestinian hotels and and, and you're you're visiting the unholy places. Uh, it, it's it's difficult to connect with that, but something about the land, and, and I, I, I've never been able to, to, I don't believe I've ever been able to describe it in any way that, that even made sense, uh, because there's something about the land that is indescribable. Those of you that have been and have truly connected with the land, you know what that is. You know, I, I was uh, I, I met somebody yesterday, and um, where I was playing golf. Okay, and this is this is <laughs> this, this golf thing that I've got going on. Uh, I'm not just not just goofing off all the time, guys, but uh, it's it's become quite a ministry actually. Uh, not the one that I would have chosen. Uh, the Playing in a in a league or around a, a bunch of uh, guys in their seventies, sometimes I feel like I'm. Uh, it's kind of like a locker room of of uh, junior high kids, but uh, that's diff- That's the subject. That's a different subject. But this this guy though is uh, I I whenever I play a league, uh, I always that morning pray that the father would team me up with the a person that uh, I could minister to, and he did that yesterday. It's somebody I'd never met before, and we're we're walking we're uh, we're you know, getting ready to tee off on a hole. And the guy looks at me and says, you know, look at this beautiful day that God's made. And I said, yeah, you know, we we live where other people vacation. The beauty of North Carolina is, is incredible. But there's a beauty that is physical here. But in Israel, there's a beauty that's spiritual. That you have to look, you have to look past a lot of things in the land to actually see the beauty of the land. And so it's a special place for him because within, I, I, let, let me, I guess we, we could say it like this, um, for me, okay, uh, I live in North Carolina, I live in Franklin, uh, we live basically in a, a little path, I got to go through a subdivision uh, to get to my house, and then there's my house. There, there's beauty all over you know, I live in the United States. Maybe you're in South Africa or, or England, and I, I just insulted uh, you on some things. Probably didn't. You probably agreed. But, uh, you know, there's, there's within the, the, the boundaries of, say, the United States, then there's, well, you know, where, where do you call home? Well, North Carolina, what part, Franklin, we're at. And you, you get it down to where there, then there's that, house that you have and that's your home and the same thing is true with the almighty that uh in we look at john three sixteen. yes he loves the whole world but there is a place within the whole world he he narrows it down to a a, a cut a, a section of the world which is the middle east and he narrows it down to a country which is israel And then he narrows it down to a city, which is Jerusalem. And then he narrows that down to a place called the Temple Mount, in which he will set up his home in there. And so the land of Israel, regarding the the, the world, the land of Israel, and I I don't know why specifically, that's, that's his business. He's the one that chose to live there. But it's a special possession to him. And so what is he telling us here in this verse of the land is not to be sold because the land belongs to me? It is saying to us that I'm giving you something that is very special. I'm giving you a unique gift that is only to you. And he says, 
and he goes on in these uh, in in much of the rest of Leviticus, uh, the rest of the book actually, and gives us some uh, some instructions regarding how we are to treat the land, how we are to treat other people in the land. What are we to do with the poor, the needy, the widow, the orphan? And, and what are we to do with the times that he's given to us? He says in uh, chapter 26 of verse 2, Keep my Shabbats and revere my sanctuary. I am yud heh Now, what what Shabbats, what, what is this word? What is the, the Shabbat? Is it just the, the, the seventh day? Well, it, it is the seventh day. But what about the Shabbats that are within? And I, I see maybe it's some you know people just growing into it, I guess. But you know there are other Shabbats within the Scriptures. Go back to Leviticus chapter twenty-three. Uh, the first day of of matzah is a Shabbat. The last day of matzah is a Shabbat. The first day of Sukkot is a Shabbat. The last day is a, is a Shabbat. Uh, Yom Kippur is a Shabbat. And maybe those days sometimes fall on Shabbat, but if they don't, they're still a Shabbat. And how are we, how are we doing it revering them, not just the weekly Shabbat? In the land, you know, things are going to be different. I don't know what we're going to be doing. I, I have my, my theories, but at this point in time, they're, that, that's all they are. Their theories. What is it going to be when we get there? I don't know. What will be the commerce of that day? I, I don't know. How much will we be as those of, uh, they're part of that resurrected body, how much are we involved in that commerce? Uh, the exchanging of, of the bartering. What, what's it going to be? I, I don't know. I don't know. But I know this, if you're maybe working for someone, you'll, you'll never have to ask for the day off because it's going to be there. If, you're, if you own your own business, in the see, maybe you never thought of these things. And that's what we should be doing is, is considering them, thinking about it, dreaming about it, about what it's going to be like. Because the more you can get in touch with that dream of what's on the horizon the more you will long for it and the, the more that you will be determined to get there. You know, it, it's like taking a trip. Uh, anybody that's ever taken a trip with me knows uh, we don't stop a lot, okay? We stop if, uh, you know, if you've got to go, well, hold it just a little longer. <laughs> uh, my, my wife and children understand that one. Uh, we, we stop if we got to get gas, okay? But other than that, I just don't stop a lot. Why? Because I have a vision of what's on the horizon. I want to get there. I want to be there because there is, you know, th this thing, you know, travel is so wonderful. No, travel is, is terrible. It's, it's the destination that we're, that we're longing for. And so maybe if we get, uh, if we get, more in touch with the dream of the destination it will produce more of a longing for the destination and will keep us from making side trips and exits that shouldn't really be you know we, we should have no we didn't need to go to that uh i didn't need to spend five hours at bucky's for those of you that know about bucky's verse three uh, I see verse 2, going back to there. And revere my sanctuary. How much of a reverence do we have today for a sanctuary that's not even built? Again, is there a longing for? I mean, consider the, the thought of, uh, <clears throat> of yes, I, I'm, wanting to, I'm wanting him to return. I'm wanting him to set up his kingdom, but... Ah, oh, that house is nothing. Well, it, it, you know, if you invited me to your to your house for 
you know, spend, you know, hey, Mike, come, you know, you, you got to come and spend a couple of days with us. And, you know, I pull up in the driveway and, and uh, walk in and you, you greet it. Well, where, where are we going to stay? Oh, we, we didn't prepare a place for you. How, how would you feel? I mean, it's like, <laughs> really? I guess you really didn't want me here because, oh, I'm, I'm sleeping outside on the back porch with the dog? Gee, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, you know, th this whole thing of longing for the temple. How's it going to, what's it going to look like? I don't know. What's it going to be like? I don't know. I, I've got some ideas. But in the end, you know, I don't think it's going to look like Herod's temple. Okay, some people don't like the fact that I don't think it's going to look like. But I don't. But what is it going to look like? I don't know. It's his house. He's the one designing it. And so, I, you know, if, if it's his house, if I was to design a house, uh, I may ask your opinion. I may not. Because in the end, it's my house. And so what's it going to look like in the end? It's his house. It'll look like what he wants it to look like. Period. Okay? But that doesn't mean that I don't need to be involved in the longing for that house. <sighs> yeah. If you live by my regulations, by my mitzvot and observe them, then I will. <sighs> you know, there's a point, there's a part of the scripture that is for the land. Uh, when we go to the to the to the Yovel, to the a lot of things, I, you know, the the festivals. Is it a requirement? Hey, settle down. Is it a requirement that we that we observe the festivals in exile? I think we could argue about that. I, I don't want to. I'm not going to argue. But uh, you know, I mean, I think it's rehearsals. I think it's a good thing to do, and I'm not discouraging anyone from, and uh, because I feel we should be doing the the festivals to the best of our ability. But there's a level of the festivals that we can't do here. It's not going to happen, and there's going to be difficulties, and there's going to be trials, and there's going to be all kinds of things. But you know, the trials should produce a longing. The trials of this day should produce a hunger for the land and for his kingdom and for his return. Let's not spend as much time focusing on the things that are happening around us. As, and you know, people get angry at it and, you know, get mad at this and mad at, mad at that politician. Whatever, they're going to be who they are. At times they're going to be who, what they are. Turn that anger, you know, does that anger actually get you anywhere? Um, I, I don't like seeing people abused. I don't like seeing people used by, by the powers that be, whether it be political or religious. And religious is the one that really bothers me even more. But at the same time, should how, what's that anger do? Is it, is it really helping you? Is it causing your blood pressure to come down? Is it causing your stress level to come down? Is it, is it causing your house to be more peaceful when, when you get angry about it all? Probably not. So instead of becoming angry, maybe we should turn that into a, a, an aspect of our yearning. A yearning for him and for it to all be in his hands and all be done and uh, as the, the old song said, when it's all been said and done, a longing for home. You know, it was, uh, wow, almost, uh, you know, it's, what, 80-something years ago now, a time of the Shoah, the Holocaust. I want to go to something that I, I haven't pulled out. I was thinking about this last night as I was talking to the guys on, uh, on Life on Purpose. But uh, this, is, this is interesting. It comes from at the the two thousand, and I, I I'm not promoting this movie at all, okay? But if you those of you that saw the movie, uh, I don't watch this one anymore because it's, it's kind of creepy in places. But um, 
I mean, for those that saw, have seen this movie, uh, consider the, the message. Consider the underlying message of this, this movie, okay? But at the, uh, the 2014 Oscars, they celebrated the 75th anniversary of the release of The Wizard of Oz by having Pink uh, sing Somewhere Over the Rainbow with highlights from the film in the background. You know, I'm, I'm reading this of 2014 and the 75th anniversary of the release of The Wizard of Oz. Uh, and now here we just celebrated the 75th anniversary of what would come out of the Holocaust, the Shoah. But what pe few people realize while listening to that incredible performer singing that unforgettable song is the music is deeply embedded in the Jewish experience. The fi film came out on January 1st uh, of 1939. This was less than two months after the notorious Kristallnacht, the, the night of cr the broken glass. And, and, okay, the movie came out less than two months after the night of broken glass. Wow. Okay, so the movie was already in the can, right? When Jewish businesses were looted, synagogues attacked, and Jewish storefronts had their windows smashed by Nazi regime in Germany, World War II was exactly eight months away. In other words, the Holocaust was about to begin. Six million Jews would be murdered, one million of them children, for no other reason than they were Jews. And two Jewish men, Harold Arlen and Yip Harburg, uh, wrote a song that would be the theme the, the main song of that Wizard of Oz, which is actually a musical, I guess. And it says, uh, just read through the, the lyrics here real quick. Somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, there's a land that I heard of once in a lullaby. Somewhere over the rainbow, skies are blue, and the dreams that you dare to dream really do come true. Someday I'll wish upon a star and wake up where the clouds are far behind me. Where troubles melt like lemon drops, away above the chimney tops, that's where you'll find me. Somewhere over the rainbow, blue birds fly. So, blue birds fly over the rainbow, why then oh why can't I? If happy little blue birds fly beyond the rainbow, why oh why can't I? Let me go back to the words and insert a few words of my own. Somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, Aliyah. There's a land, the New Jerusalem, that I heard of once in a lullaby. Because Jewish lullabies are about the kingdom to come. Somewhere over the rainbow, skies are blue, and the dreams that you dare to dream really do come true in 1948. Someday I'll wish upon a star of Bethlehem, the Messiah, the Mogan David, the reestablishment of Israel. And I'll wake up where the clouds of the furnace smoke are way behind me. Where troubles, the sour of life, melt like lemon drops and become sweet. Way above the chimney tops of the furnaces, that's where you'll find me. There, the commentary of this goes on to say, the Jews of Europe could not fly. They could not escape beyond the rainbow. Harburg was almost precedent when he talked about, the, about wanting to fly like a bluebird away from the chimney tops. In the post-Auschwitz era, chimney tops have taken on a whole different meaning than they had at the beginning of 1939. Prophetic, wasn't it? The truth is, though, that, and I can back this up with, um, I believe, with a lot of facts, going back to uh, Rabbi Jabotinsky, who was going around Europe at the day, in the day before World War II and telling the people that were there, it's time to, to begin to long for home. It's time to go to Israel. It's time to get out of Europe. And... For the most part, his words were on deaf ears. What produced, and this is a very harsh statement that I'm going to make 
uh, one that I've talked with Hanok about, uh, one that actually has some roots, I believe, in uh, in what Mir Kahana, Rabbi Mir Kahana, was speaking of before he was murdered. Um, why was the Holocaust, for the most part, it was because of a lack of yearning to go home. See, there was a time in which the Jews, the southern kingdom, Judah, could have gone back to Israel. But Europe had become home. So why leave? Well, our kids just started school and we have a business and all of these things and life is good. And yeah, there's some difficulties and some trials, but overall, we're just going to stay. We're going to stay behind. And for 6 million, including, I believe the number is 1.5 million children, the reason for the death was because of a lack of yearning for home. Today I ask, based upon the teaching that uh, I believe in regarding the northern and southern kingdom, Ephraim and Judah, you go to Ezekiel 37, the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones. Um, Judah, the southern kingdom has had, I, this is just my, my thinking, has had their their time of, of dry bones and life is coming back. But what about Ephraim? What about Ephraim in the nations? And those of, of us that are being awakened to our heritage, awakened to who we are as a part of, a part of Israel, awakened to the instructions that have been given to us. This is, this is not about. The, the reason you were brought into this, uh, this, this Torah lifestyle was not so you could find out how to do it right in exile. It was to cause a yearning for home. It was to cause you to start to stare through the windshield of what is ahead of us. But for Ephraim, is it possible? And I, I know that, you know, for, for the vast majority of us, we're not able to go to Israel. Uh, there are some ways it's difficult. Uh, so this is not a, a, a call for, you know, for everybody to try to figure out how to make Aliyah. But at the same time, they, they may be able to, the, the powers that be in a secular Israel, uh, it's what it was set up to be, so I, I'm not judging that. But the powers that be may be able to take to keep my body out of the land. But they can't keep me out of the land. They can't keep my spirit. They can't keep my soul. They can't keep my longing. They can't keep my desire out of the land. There's coming a day that that desire, that longing is going to, be, uh, is going to become a reality. But will that reality be only to those who had the longing? Will others be, eh, as, the, uh, as the, the book series said, left behind? I guess those are things we'll all figure out. It, come, caused me to, it causes me to once again consider, and, and I know this is America, United States specific, but uh, it's... Could, could be for other countries too, but specifically for America. Uh, will America become Ephraim's Shoah? Will America become Ephraim's vision of the valley, or not vision, but will, if, will America become Ephraim's dry bones? I guess we'll just have to wait and see. There's an interesting story to, to start to close this up. Interesting story in the book of Ruth. Uh, you might want to go back and read this story afterwards. It's a, a yeah, beautiful love story, uh, of course, of of Ruth and Boaz. But really, the 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 story you got to you got to go back a little ways in this one to really understand what is going on. There's a reason why Ruth comes into Boaz's life. 
And that is because she was willing to redefine the word home in her own life. Uh, we, we follow the story with, with Ruth and Naomi and, and Orpah. And, uh, they come to the border. And go back and, and look at all the context of this and the relationships and everything else. But they, they come to the border and Naomi looks at the two girls and says, Okay, this is really as far as you need to go. Um, I cannot provide husbands for you. I really can't uh, tell you what is going to be. I, I can't make any guarantees for you. So why don't you just turn around right here and go back? We see these two women both with uh, the same decision, but making different choices. Ruth, of course, would make those infamous, would, would, would give, bring forth those infamous words, uh, your, I will follow you wherever you go, your God will be my God, your people will be my people, and, and she moves on from there. But the other one is the one that I'd like to focus on just for a moment, and that is Orpah. Who it says that she wept with great emotion. She kissed her mother-in-law on the cheek. And then she turned around. And she left. And becomes irrelevant to the story. See, she, she gave the emotional response. She gave the kiss. The kiss of goodbye. And turned around and walked away. And because of that, I do not know, I don't believe that the scripture ever mentions her again. If, if it does, I, I, I'm just not aware of it. But Ruth, however, she decides to make a change in her life, of her heritage. She would be the, the one that we would refer to today as the foreigner who has joined themselves to Hashem. She would be the one that would be the grafted in. She would be the one that's adopted into the family. She would be the one that would have full rights. She would be the one that would be brought to the feet of Boaz. She would be the one who would be in the lineage of Messiah himself. So, Adonai spoke to Moshe on Mount Sinai. And he said, tell the people of Israel, when you enter the land I am giving you, how many will enter the land? And how many will just stand at the border? Be emotional. Give it a kiss. And walk away. Never to be heard from again. We have a choice. We have a choice to follow the footsteps of Ruth, or the footsteps of Orpah, Orpha, Orpha. What a crazy name that is. I mean, no wonder she, she turned around with a name like that. We have a choice of which of these women we want to follow. So I question today, what is our longing? What is our desire? Are we dreaming about his kingdom? Is that dream producing works in our lives, works of, 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 of prayer for Israel, for those that are part of Israel, for, for blessing financially. What's it, what's it doing? What's it affecting? Or is it affecting us? Because if our dream is not affecting us, it's just a dream on the horizon. Maybe that dream needs to be turned into a vision, which is something that we own and we take part in. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Tov. Have a blessed, prosperous week. Bez Rad Hashem, God willing. See you again next week. And until then, be strong. Yivarech Adonai V'yishmarecha Ya'er Adonai Panav Elecha V'yichunecha Yisa Adonai Panav Elecha
ברכה, ויעשם לך שלום.